check for a All right, this is an interview at the Best Western Hotel, Delaware Avenue, Buffalo, New York. It is the 22nd of February, 2006, approximately 10.30 a.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? My name is John Henry Kolecki, and I was born in North Tonawanda, New York, on August 14, 1920. Okay, what was your educational background prior to entering service? Well, I was a graduate of North Tonawanda High School, and I was in my junior year at Canisius College when I volunteered to join the Marine Corps. Okay. Uh, do you remember where you were, how you heard, and your reaction to Pearl Harbor? I believe I was at my girlfriend's home. It was a Sunday morning, a Sunday afternoon, rather. And that's about all that I can recall. Mm -hmm. It was on a Sunday, and I was at the girl's friend. Either I was there for brunch or lunch. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Do you remember any reaction at all when you heard about Oh, that? very much surprised. Uh, I didn't think that anything like that could happen mm -hmm. in our times. Although I, I, I was intrigued with the negotiations uh, going on in uh, Washington because at that time there were two Japanese ministers that went to Washington to uh, negoti negotiate some kind of an agreement dealing with lifting the embargo on scrap iron and on oil and, and uh, somehow that the Japanese economy was uh, very adversely affected by uh, by our actions in the in the Far East. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, why did you uh, decide to enlist? Well, I, I actually I was jealous of all the other guys that were going into the service, and I was still a student, and I was left alone, and that kind of put me in some bad straits. I, I didn't feel good, so. Uh, there was a speaker that arrived at Canisius College, and there was sort of an assembly, students assembled, and I was impressed with the Marine Corps speaker, so I, I decided to join the Marine Corps. Okay, that was my next question, why the Marines? Okay, yeah. when did you uh, go into the Marine Corps? I believe it was in 1942. But, uh, the, but I wasn't called to active duty till about maybe four or five months later. Mm -hmm. Okay. Where did you go for basic training? Uh, I went to uh, uh, San Diego for my boot camp. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, what was that like and how long? Well, it was uh, rather strenuous, but uh, I, I didn't mind, I didn't mind the rigorous demands that were imposed on me. Uh, actually, the first two weeks were the hardest. Then the uh, third, fourth, fifth week, we spent three weeks on the firing range where the pressure was somewhat off the, uh, mm -hmm. off the uh, recruit. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how long total was your basic training? I believe it was seven weeks. Okay. The total was seven weeks and then uh, I joined the, uh, we had a, a choice of whichever services we want to go with, either into artillery or infantry, whatever. Uh, and I joined the paratroops. I wanted to go to the paratroop school. Now, why was that? Did you have any well, I, I was uh, I was a pilot. I, I actually had a private's license. I could have joined the Air Force, but for some reason, I had a premonition that I would die in an airplane, but I wouldn't die on a battlefield. Mm -hmm. uh, so I abandoned my hopes of being a pilot to becoming a uh, uh, a paratrooper, mm -hmm. and I joined the paratroops okay. at Camp Gillespie in, in California, and strange thing happened that in the course of my training, the paratroop program was abandoned. So consequently, uh, here I was, uh, ready to get my wings, so to speak, and uh, the program was canceled, and uh, uh, the 4th Paratroop Battalion, which I was in, the 4th Paratroop Battalion formed the nucleus of the 5th Marine Corps Division.
Had you made any jumps at that point? I never got to it. I got as far as folding the par parachute. <laughs> oh. That's as far as I got. <laughs> I did a lot of running, believe me. Uh -huh. Oh, we, the calisthenics and, and the exercises and the running that we had to do were quite extensive, quite demanding. But I, I accepted the challenge. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so you went into the Marine, 5th Marine Division? Uh, At Camp Pendleton. Okay. After the paratroop school was, uh, was disbanded, I went to Camp Pendleton forming the 5th Marine Corps Division. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, where did you go from there? Well, from there uh, we went to Hawaii, uh, the main island, and uh, there was Camp Tarawa where we did extensive training. Uh, even uh, at one time we, we had maneuvers under uh, round fire, real mm -hmm. fire. Uh, and uh, from uh, Camp Tar Tar Tarawa uh, we then went aboard ship and took us almost like all the, over a little month before we hit Iwo Jima. We stopped at fair, several places. We stopped at Kawajalan, at Saipan, and Tinian, and then finally uh, we assaulted the island. Mm -hmm. Were you on the first wave? Yes, we were in the first wave. And I remember just before I hit the beach, somebody offered me a chewing gum. Of all things, I swear not. I took the chewing gum, and uh, we landed on, on shore, and I hopped on the sides. I was a BER man, by the way, a mm -hmm. Browning automatic rifle, and uh, I hit the beach and was very hard running. It was sort of a, a ash, deep, black gray sand. Uh, traction was very hard, but anyway, I made up to a slope and I placed my BER and I and I hardly to. Uh, to my friend Peck. Peck, bring me the ammo. And, and as I turn and I says, Peck, bring me the ammo, a bullet grazed my eye and the top of my nose. Just as I turned, Peck, give me the ammo, a bullet grazed me and tore the lower line and, and tore the skin off the ridge of my nose. Had I been looking forward, I probably would have lost both of my eyes and the bridge of my nose. Fortunately, the, I, I, I turned to my right askew and that kind of saved my life. But a stupid thing happened. A corpsman immediately applied, gave me a shot of morphine, bandaged my both eyes so that I couldn't see. I somehow crawled into a shell hole, a deep shell hole, that you, that you could even put a little cottage. It must have been a shell hole uh, exploded by a 16-inch naval gun, I assume. And after a while, I said, I, I got to take a look, see what's going on. So uh, I, I know I, I was, uh, I felt some slight pain because the morphine immediately took action. Uh, I lifted my right eye and I looked at the crest of the, the shell hole and there's a huge floating Japanese mine. How it got there, I don't know. I tried to crawl out of this jail, but I couldn't. So some other Marine came by, saw me there, and started yelling, you get out of there before that thing explodes. And he gave me a hand. Somehow, was it a, he took his sling off his rifle and handed it to me. But anyway, he got me out. And then I was escorted uh, to the beach, and I ended up on the hospital ship. So I was on the hospital ship all about a week or more. Well, being aboard ship, uh, they treated my eye and nose with some kind of compresses. And I, and I questioned the, the nurse, oh, why don't you apply... Uh, sulfur powder because that's what we were using at that mm -hmm. time on any wound. Sulfur powder was the thing. She says, no, we have to put these, these it seemed like Vaseline compresses they put. He says, we want 
we want the wound to heal from the inside out. This way you won't have a scar. So I went along with it, okay. Well, about the third or fourth day, I was ambulatory, by the way, uh, aboard ship. Uh, in fact, uh, the chaplain came to me and says, uh, John, I see you're walking around. W would you serve as an honor guard? We're going to have a burial at sea. And I said, of course, Father, sure. So this was a very sad situation. Here they put this dead Marine into a plastic bag and some weights, which I assume were at the feet, and they had it on, on a, like, a, like a stretcher. They put the colors, the flag, over the corpse. The taps were played, and then the, the, uh, the, the chaplain read a verse from the Bible or something he said, and then gingerly we kind of lowered the stretcher and the deceased was dumped into the Blue Pacific. It was very sad. The whole thing was over in about five, eight minutes. And I sometimes think about being the honor guard at that very, very sad funeral. When I go to funerals today, it's a half a day affair. Mm -hmm. you have flowers and the coffin and all that lamenting a mass or a service of some sort. And here, here was a boy that died and the parents didn't even know what it was all about, what happened. Yeah, very sad. Well, anyway, to make a long story a little longer, <laughs> I bumped into a friend of mine from my platoon, aboard ship, Tucker was his name, and he told me he got wounded through the calf of his leg. A he showed me his beautiful wound. And uh, so we, we had uh, lunch together, we conversed about things going on, and then about the sixth or seventh day, the the announcer came out and said, now hear this, hear this, any Marine desiring to return to uh, a shore with the doctor's permission may do so. So he looked at me and I looked at him and we were briefed that the whole operation will be over in seven days. There might be three additional days mopping up the fanatics. So I said, okay, you want to go talk? Yeah, all right, let's go. So he, we went to the doctor, the doctor gave us an okay, we went back ashore. And I had the hardest time to find my outfit, but I finally did. One, uh, he must have been an artillery observer, so he said, well, the, the 27th Regiment and the Company B is in this direction, we finally got there. Well, in as I was trying to get in touch with my uh, platoon, I really saw behind the lines, the horrors of the war, of the combat. That's where I saw many of our GIs being stacked like logs under a lean-to before they were married. And there were, oh, there were all kinds of dead Japanese soldiers in trenches where they committed harry-carry. And their modus of operation was they would take a grenade put it under their chin, pulled a pin, and blew their heads. And I saw many dead Japanese defenders with their arms blown off and their heads blown off. Or, or they would take a rifle and take their sandal, whatever. They mostly they, they seem to be wearing like sandals. And they would put the toe into the trigger mechanism, put the rifle under their chin, and blow their heads off. And there were scores of these dead Japanese defenders, rather than surrendering, which would be, well, most humiliating and dishonorable. Mm -hmm. And so, consequently, rather than surrendering. And I understand that only about 400 surrendered after the battle out of 22,000 defending Japanese soldiers. The rest were killed. And they were buried in mass graves anywhere, 50, 100, little marker. Yeah, very sad. Mm -hmm.
So you got wounded a second time. Didn't yeah, you? the second time we made an we made several assaults on on ridges, and um, before we make an assault, they would soften up the ground with, with mortar shells or artillery. Well, I happened to be in a foxhole, um, and one of the shells I think landed too too close. I was curled up like that, and the shrapnel hit hit me in the, in the, in, in the uh, above the wrist, uh, no, right, right here, near the wrist area, and in my leg, my thigh. Uh, I had some very unusual experiences. Um, we were, we were caught under friendly fire too. We, we moved up on the ridge one day and, uh, uh, someone goofed back on the lines, and they thought they were we were Japanese, and we got peppered with American artillery, and that was horrendous. It was unbelievable what our artil artillery could do. We lost uh, seven men. We are sh lost our uh, executive officer, and after the dust cleared it was unbelievable the havoc that that an artillery a barrage can create and and it was a very very unfortunate sad situation that our boys opened up on us it was a some kind of a snafu but it didn't last long it probably lasted a minute but it, when you're under fire like that it you think it'll never let up Mm -hmm. It was a terrible experience. I had an operatic experience too. Uh, we were moving up. It was just about the, the night was closing in, and we were moving up on the front lines. And somehow the Japanese spotted us and started peppering us with mortar shells. So naturally, we got to look for cover. And I spotted there a sort of a made-up um, foxhole with rocks arranged. I didn't want to jump in because sometimes these places were booby-trapped, you know. But I had to take a chance. So I jumped in there, and to the side of me, as I jumped in, there was a dead Japanese soldier. He was clean-shaven. He had a clean uniform. He just had a trickle of blood on the side. Apparently somebody shot him right through the head. And, and there was enough room for me to kind of crawl up to him, which, which I dared to do, but I had to. I had no choice. And he apparently had a little picture that he put among the rocks of a girl. So it must have been the wife or the sweetheart of this dead Japanese soldier. And so I had a dead companion for the night <laughs> with a picture of his girlfriend or wife, I don't know. Well, anyway, I spent the night with, with a dead Japanese soldier. I was kind of safe, though. I felt safe, too. Yeah. Yeah, there was some sad. We, we, we had replacements that sometimes lasted a day or two. Uh, I became a squad leader. The the Castaneda, our corporal of our squad, became the platoon leader. We had five in my platoon. Five lieutenants were either shot or wounded. And uh, and some of them, own, I, I understand, uh, 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 Lieutenant Stan Holmes, who was our original platoon leader, was killed on on D Day. So the, the replacements that followed, they lasted a day or two. Or, and it seemed that uh, they were primary targets of, of snipers, Japanese snipers. Some of the platoon leaders I n never got acquainted with, or I don't even remember their names. Yeah. How did you like the VAR as a weapon? I liked it very much. Yeah, I... I uh, like when you uh, went I, back in combat the second time, you were still... It's still BAR. I still had the BAR. I still uh -huh. use it. And, you know, 
in combat, I don't think I fired more than five rounds. And the only Jap that I saw, a dead Jap, Japanese soldier, I saw him in a trench, and I saw his helmet, and he threw a grenade at me. And it wasn't a, a shrapnel grenade, it was a concussion grenade. Mm -hmm. And this bounced around, it exploded, nothing happened. I tried to, sh tried to shoot at him, but he was so fast, I fired after he had gone already. It was, so, it was yeah. You know, the, the Japanese were, were very crafty soldiers. Their camouflage was something unique, something they could be proud of, really. To spot a live Japanese soldier was not, not easy mm -hmm. because they were camouflaged and they had all kinds of foxholes, caves that they jumped out, fired a few rounds, and they would hide. Now, there was an incident towards the end, before I got wounded the second time. Our platoons uh, surrounded, if, the, if I may use that word, a cave. And uh, a, a Japanese officer came out with the, the truce, white flag. And he starts mumbling something, and eventually they caught on. He wanted a translator. So, uh, some half an hour or something later, an, an American translator started to communicate with this Japanese officer. And what we were told was that there were 16 men in this cave. And they're going to come to a decision what they're going to do. So this Japanese uh, uh, officer says, I'll be back at 11 o'clock in the evening. And uh, we'll see whether we're going to surrender or not. Well, there was a Bushido code, you know, that every Japanese soldier is supposed to kill till American soldiers before he, he dies. So we figured, well, maybe they'll surrender, maybe they won't. Maybe they'll come out and make a bonsai charge against us rather than surrendering because they, they were fanatical f fighters. The Japanese did not honor themselves in, in, in surrendering to the Americans. Well, anyway, so I was, I was stationed above the cave and the rest of the uh, squad, platoon, were outside the per immediate area of the cave because if they come out bonsai charge we got to have room to fire and that's so we don't fire at each other they could be done very easily well 11 o'clock came and nothing happened and we began to whisper well what are they going to do what are they going to do well we'll just sit tight so we sat tight and it was about maybe 15 20 minutes after 11 there was a volcanic explosion I guess what they did, they stalled for time to get any kind of explosives together, figuring they're going to commit Harry Carey and they'll take us along with them. Figuring that they had, and it was a humongous explosion, really. The, the, the mouth of the, of the cave was like a huge shotgun. The blast came out with dust and fire. I was like here and, and, and the fire came this way and the explosion. There was a huge wave. That's the only thing I did, I just curled up and nothing happened. But there were some guys who just were so sh shell-shocked they could not speak. The ones that were closer to the mouth of the cave. They, I remember this, this Olmsted, he was a corporal. The guys had to carry him. He, he was just, his nerves were gone. Right? And I could see a person suffering from shell shock. I've seen it with my own eyes. The blast is so terrific, so frightening, that you think you're going to die or you might even feel that you are dead. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let me ask you something about your BAR. Did you leave the bipod on the end, or did you take I, it off? I, uh, I took it off on and off. Sometimes it was a nuisance mm -hmm. with, with this. Um, 
so sometimes I just fold it under, and I used it that way. Yeah, but as I said before, I don't think I fired more than five or six rounds because I couldn't see any live. At night, there was a case where some Japanese soldiers was left behind our lines. And then in the middle of the night, might have been one or two o'clock in the morning, he tried to run back to his line. And that's the only, I didn't even fire because I didn't see him. Mm -hmm. But of course, he, when he ran from behind our lines, hoping to reach his lines, he took a chance when the flares weren't up. You know, they would sporadically shoot these uh, flares, parachute mm -hmm. flares. Yeah. Uh, so he apparently took a chance. I didn't see him, but the guy next to me, the, the, the Marine there, I think it was Dick Hines, he says, I got a shot at him. And the next morning, he said, they got this fellow who tried to. And the strange part was, we had a dog on the front line, and the dog never sniffed him out. Hmm. Yeah, he somehow got through, but never made it back to his lines. Yeah. Now, is this a unit dog that you had with you, or one you? Uh, I didn't know how they or? operated. The, the, the dog was there, and how, uh, what uh, mechanics of these, how they rationed these dogs on the front line, I don't know. I had no idea. But, but we did have a dog, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, now, were you ever aware of the flag raising? And Suribachi or I found out later. Later, okay. Not not during the battle. Uh -huh. No, I wasn't aware of it. No. Uh -huh. um, when you were wounded the second time, did they uh, have to take you off on a stretcher because you were wounded in the leg? Or? No, I I was I was able to after the barrage lifted and the assault was made. I got up and the corpsman just escorted me back behind the lines, and fortunately he wagged the jeep waved a, a, a jeep and he took me to the field hospital mm -hmm. and at the field hospital the doctor looked me over put me aboard plane and I, and I uh, ended up in the uh, Guam hospital and I was there for a week and later I was flown to uh, Hawaii, Honolulu for r and &R. stayed there and uh, oh about Three four days afterwards, I rejoined my unit on uh, the main island, Tarawa, uh -huh. Camp Tarawa. Uh -huh. Yeah. Where were you when you uh, heard about the death of President Roosevelt? Did Let's see. I was. I think I was. To, I might have been at uh, recreation room. What happened after I got? Uh, the fact that I was wounded twice, I was entitled to a 10-day furlough, mm -hmm. see. So, uh, I went home for 10 days and I came back and they didn't know what to do with me because I was recommended for officer's training and the war was coming to a close. So they put me in charge of a recreational room, hall, ping pongs and, and, and pool table. Now whereabouts was this? Camp Tarawa. Tarawa. Uh, no, no, Camp Pendleton. Pendleton. Camp okay. Pendleton. So I was on duty eight hours and two days off. <laughs> I didn't have enough money to enjoy the two days off because <laughs> I'd go to L.A. And, and there was a cheap that there was a church, a Catholic church, cost cost me a dime, no dime or twenty five cents. I don't recall now. Was it ten cents or twenty five cents? They provided me with a bed, a towel, and clean sheets to spend the night. So naturally, I went to L.A. as often as I could. Yeah, and the way I got there was mostly hitchhiking. Sometimes I take the train, but the train was packed, it was standing room only. Unbelievable how, how, how congested mm -hmm. the public transportation was from Pendleton to L.A. So I, I preferred hitchhiking. At least I had a little elbow room. 
you know, and you, usually the, the truckers were pretty good, mm -hmm. and even civilians sometimes picked up uh, Marines, take them to Pendleton, yeah. I mean to uh, L.A. How did you personally feel about the death of the president? Do you recall that at all? Or? Uh, <clears throat> I, I thought more about the guys that, the friends that I lost in combat than I did about the uh -huh. president, okay. really. I had some very close personal friends, and, and I saw one of them get shot through the neck, and I saw him die. I couldn't do anything about it. Uh, the, the corpsman came, started applying a, a bandage to prevent the bleeding. He'd tear it off. He'd be shaking. I think he actually died probably drowning in his own blood. Uh, he died a terrible death. Uh, so my thoughts were more on what happened uh, at the battle than uh -huh. I did. Of course, I, I knew the president died, and, and we all thought, well, and th the word was out already. The war is, war is practically over. It's the, the, the Germans and the Italians were already surrendering, and I was thinking more of going home than, than anything else. Yeah. Did you have a reaction at all to the dropping the atomic bombs? Yes, I had a reaction. Now, I, uh, uh, I, I recall my high school uh, chemistry uh, teacher. Uh, we, we discussed about atomic energy, and th he gave us a very cursory uh, uh, explanation of the atomic bomb. He says, this, once they do this, this perfect this uh, separating the atom, that only an ounce could blow up a city block. And we, there was quite a discussion. And uh, so I associated that lecture, that one ounce of split atoms blowing up a city block with a bomb blowing up a city. Uh -huh. uh, I had such a very vague outline what the atomic bomb was. And I, I tried to imagine what the city would l look like after the atomic bomb. But I had a very vague knowledge of, uh -huh. of the A-bomb. Very vague. Yeah. Okay. What was it like you were in California then? What was it like when the war ended? Oh, oh, that was good time. Oh, great celebrations. Uh, I, 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 at the time when the war ended, I was already on the way hitchhiking to Pendleton, mm -hmm. back to camp, when the announcement came. Yeah, uh, it was a great uh, relief. Okay. Great. And I had enough points, you know, like uh, I, I was. They had a point system, and I think I was six points shy of being uh, discharged from the service. So something happened that later they even lowered the points, and I was discharged in November of 1945. I came home like uh, <coughs> four, a little after Thanksgiving, a couple of days after uh -huh. our Thanksgiving. Yeah. Okay. And so when that happened, I. I went on a visit to Canisius where I was matriculating just before I went in the service and the dean spotted me. Oh, I remember Father Sullivan says, oh John, good to see you. I never knew he knew my name. I said, oh, so I see you're back in school. I said, no, I just came in to see if I could bump into some of my old cronies. You mean you haven't registered? No, I was late two weeks. You come in Monday, you're registered. I said, well, uh, there's some courses that I, that I need to take. They're not available. Don't worry about that. You just come in Monday. You're registered. You're starting school Monday. So I'm back in the following year in March. I got my sheepskin. So you used the GI Bill for that? Well, I, I used I, <laughs> Because I was twice wounded, I was under public law 16. I was entitled to 48 months, actual months of education. So a school year... That commission was only eight or nine months, so I had all those 48 months to chew up. So I went back to Canisius, got my BS, then I, then I went to uh, 
Niagara, got my master's degree in, 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 in a master's of arts. Then I, then I got a grant to study, you know, uh, when they launched the Sputnik, there was a cry for more Russian language. So I went to an adult education course also and I took Russian. So I had a little bit of Russian so I applied for this federal grant and they, they accepted me. They sent me, the federal government sent me to Northwestern University for the summer and then the following year, the second part of the program, they sent me to Indiana University to study Russian language and culture and the second part of the Indiana program was five weeks in the Soviet Union. So I was an exchange student in the Soviet Union in 1963. That's when that uh, the Vietnam War really got with what was that bay where where, where Johnson yeah, kind of talking about? Bay. Yeah. Uh, well, anyway, uh, I uh, I spent five weeks in the Soviet Union, and the program entailed visiting uh, several universities, museums, art galleries. Uh, conversing with r Russian students. Now the Russian students wanted to speak English and we wanted to speak Russian because <laughs> they wanted to sharpen their English, we wanted to sharpen. Well anyway, I was fortunate to be one of the 64 students that were chosen under this program to go to the Soviet Union. I came back and then there was a New York State grant to study Russian. So I applied and I got that state grant and it was offered at Canisius College. So I went there, continued with my Russian language and it was in the summer of 63. I was an exchange student the second time to the Soviet Union. No, no. 66. 66. 66, yeah. I was an exchange student to the Soviet Union in 66. I spent the entire summer, it was 60 some days. I had a good time. But, uh, you know, some of the students had a hard time to acclimate themselves and, and some of the food that, that was served was not palatable. I'm of Slavic des descent, so I, I, I'm used to sour cream and I'm e used buttermilk. to buttermilk and sauerkraut, <laughs> and pig's feet and all that. The Americans being in the so, you know, for breakfast they would serve not orange juice, they would serve kefir, which is sour milk, as a breakfast drink. Mm -hmm. To me, I drank sour milk, buttermilk, it didn't bother me. And uh, so the, some of the students complained about the food, uh, but uh, we were treated very, very well by the communist uh, guests, mm -hmm. very, very well. And we went to various art galleries, and we visited several cities. We didn't stay long. We spent some time in Kiev, in Leningrad, in Moscow, Baku, and Sochi. We Tbilisi. went as far east, Tbilisi. We went far east as uh, Baku on the Caspian Sea. I, I still recall we were going by bus, and we were outside the city limits, and you could smell naphtha, you could smell the oil. Mm -hmm. And when we got closer to the city, there was a forest of oil derricks, all wooden ones. They were not out of steel, wood, wooden derricks. You know, they needed how to pump the oil from the ground. Yeah, that's the, and the architecture was sort of a, a mixture of uh, European and Asiatic. You, you could tell, tell by even the fences that they had were unusual and the buildings were different. Uh, it was a very uh, enlightening experience for me on, the, on, on this, this programs that I participate. Well, anyway, I finished. I went back to school to Niagara, got my MA, and then I still had so many months left, so I went back to Canisius, got another master's degree in education. I ended up being a school teacher at the North Tonawanda School System and at the Sweet Home. And I also taught in the evening division at the Niagara County Community College, evening division. I taught Russian language in Western Civ 101.
I didn't know too much about Western Civ, but whatever I knew was enough for me to get by. Yeah. Did you uh, join any veterans organizations? Yeah, I'm a, I'm, I'm a life member of the American Legion. I'm a life member of the uh, disabled veterans. And uh, I have other private. Don Polsky, I'm a life member. And North Tonawanda, Phi Delta Kappa, I'm a life member. I joined several. Mm -hmm. Did you ever stay in contact with anyone that was in service with Oh, you? yeah. Where was that one picture? I was just showing that picture. Uh, I, I'm, oh, here. Here. There's something interesting. Th this was, I met, he, he. Oh, he, you, met, and you met Joe also. He came in one time. Was it? Now, is this fellow still alive? Yeah, he's still. He's, he's, still, in, yeah. he's in uh, Arizona. We visited him. Yeah, visited him. Okay, if you hold that in front of you, Wayne. Wait a minute, maybe I got a better picture. Wait a minute. I'll see if I got something else. Yeah, Smokey Edgar. Yeah. yeah, we still communicate. In fact, he called me just about two weeks ago. I sent him my book. He was <laughs> pleased to get the book. Yeah. After 50 years, we got together. He came down the house. Yeah, we had a good time. Now, the reason it, it had been 50 years was was he wounded too, and you guys? Oh, he was badly him? wounded. Okay. He was he was pretty badly was shot up. In fact. He was in the hospital for, oh, for several months. Mm -hmm. Somehow he got shot through the arm, his forearm, and the shoulder. Yeah, he was pretty badly shot. There was a nice picture of him and you together here. Oh, no, I think maybe this one's better. This See, is better. this oh, one doesn't, show, yeah, doesn't this show too well, right? No. Yeah. 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 After 50 years, we got together. <coughs> and we exchanged Christmas cards. Al Dunlap, too. And, and, and there's another fellow, but I never knew El. Uh, too a, a, well, yeah. Not too well, except he was a Marine. He was also on Iwo Jima. But, uh, now, were you married in the service? No. 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 Mm -hmm. After the service. Mm -hmm. right. But this fellow uh, made up now this book. Now, this fellow, Al Donald, Don, he, he, he wants to uh, identify everyone in uh, Company B. And uh, he's kind of devoted his life to. Uh, to record whatever That's all he his can. work. Uh, all his work. Yeah, that's all his work. Uh, do you have any photographs of yourself? Uh, um, taking a little time? Well, I, I have... Well, this, he's got all kinds of pictures. It's yeah. me here when I was young and foolish. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if this is going to take or not. Uh, I think... Uh, yeah, yeah. It works. Can you, can, does it come out? Yeah. Oh, okay. Now, what is that pack on your back is just uh, that you, you know what I used to do we would have inspection on Friday at uh, morning inspection and we were free until 6 in the morning the following Monday what I would do I would take a poncho maybe a blanket wrap it up and I would go to the one of the beaches in Hawaii and spend the weekend there. Oh, okay. That's yeah. Good I take some food with me, some whatever, and the, what you see here is my own made-up pack <laughs> that I would go. Yeah, I didn't recognize. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. No, okay. this was this is something that I improvised for the weekend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I would walk to the. That was a ten-mile walk, but I was young. I was able to do. Well, quite often I'd get a truck would pick me up. Yeah. Uh, give me a lift. Here's a picture of him when he was oh. in the Marine. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Beautiful yeah. picture, isn't it? That must have when you were just coming out of boot camp? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <coughs> in fact, these were borrowed blues. I didn't have any <laughs> set of blues. They didn't issue them during the war. Yeah. But anyway, I got those. Somebody. I think the photographer provided me with the blues. Mm -hmm. okay. How would you say your time in the service changed or had an effect on your life? I think I can appreciate uh, the conscientious objector, uh, the conviction that he has. I can empathize with him. Uh, I can empathize with people who detest war because I would want my son to go through the same thing that I went through. Um, I, I, 
sometimes Hollywood portrays an unfair picture of what battle is like, with the exception, the truest image of combat, I think, was the movie called Saving Private Ryan. Right. Mm -hmm. That, to me... It was an interesting picture. That for was, to me, it was pretty close, very close, uh, true to life in, in combat. Now, for example, in our company there were three platoons, 100, what was it, 144, 148 Marines. When I returned to Tarawa after I was wounded the second time, 19 of us made roll call out of the 144. These are all the people yeah. that were in that. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, he, he broke them down into this fella. Oh, that That's a battalion yeah, picture, yeah, I think. Yeah, the fella that did this book, you know? Dunlop. Dunlop, yeah. 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 Okay, well, thank you very much for you're your welcome. interview. Yeah, you're welcome.